welcome uh, to the third edition uh, of the Hildebrand uh, Zoomcast briefing room where we discuss uh, lots of things uh, to do with uh, Bond and we're doing something slightly different this week because we're actually going to be looking at that rather obvious subject but one that I personally found quite difficult, our favourite actors to play Bond. And my guest this week welcoming back uh, our resident voice of reason, the art and soul of Hildebrand, Ian Lasky. Evening, or afternoon, or morning, depending on what yeah, you're watching. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> difficult to tell these days. Um, and we've also got the collector of the group, and the man who consumed the biggest breakfast I've ever witnessed in my entire life, Matthew Grice. He Hello. And our special guest in a kind of hands across the water... To uh, Shaken Not Stirred is an admin from Shaken Not Stirred, one of two admins, I think it is, of Shaken Not Stirred, who's a, a rather brilliant sister group of ours and who's been a long time member of Hildebrand as well. Welcome to Matthew Wood. Hello, thank you. Hello, good to be here. Okay, welcome. Okay, so this week, as I said, we are going to be looking at our favourite uh, five actors to have played Bond. Now, this, uh, because uh, in Hildebrand we recognise the other actors who've played Bond, now is the time, the stampede will probably happen now, if anyone has included David Niven or Barry Nelson, now is the time to say. Do you, do you really want me to reveal my number one at this point? <laughs> oh no, it would, it would ruin it. Um, and it does mean that everyone here is going to not include one of the E.ON actors. So we've probably had to make a relatively uh, tough choice. But this is about our favourites, and it might be that our favourite has made seven films. It may be that our favourite has only made one. We will have to see, okay? Uh, so I am going to be asking first for his number five, so only the basement of the five that you picked. Matthew Grice, could you reveal your actor in number five, please. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Using, <laughs> using the state-of-the-art biro-related technology there, fantastic. In yeah. fifth place, we have Timothy Dalton there from uh, Mr. Grice. Matthew, would you uh, like to expand on your reasons why Tim's there in fifth? Um, well, first of all, I've, I've got to say that to rank all the Bond actors is extremely difficult because I sort of love them all. Um, it's not so much down to Dalton's acting ability, but I've kind of sort of thought a bit outside the box in the sense I've kind of retrospectively looked at it and whether or not he actually made such a huge impact on the series, um, which I don't think he did. And if Dalton hadn't done Bond, and say if Piers Brosnan had done The Living Daylights, I think it would have been the same. I don't think The Living Daylights was a huge success as, say, GoldenEye or Casino Royale. Um, that's certainly nothing to do with Dalton's acting ability. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think he was absolutely fantastic. And a lot of fans liked him because he was, um, you know, quite dark and played extremely gritty. And it was very much like the novels. But I think at the time, the general audience and the fans probably found it a bit too hard to accept because within 18 months, they were used to having a light-hearted Roger Moore. And then all of a sudden, they went from a light-hearted Roger Moore to a dark and gritty Timothy Dalton. Um, I mean, a lot of people do argue that Timothy Dalton was the forerunner of uh, Daniel Craig. And he was ahead of his time, which I think he was. And... Uh, Licence to Kill, uh, I mean, that's one of my favourite Bond films, and I think it's a brilliant film. But sadly, it didn't do brilliant at the box office. And um, Yeah, I mean, that could be due to tough competition, because it was going ahead with Indiana Jones, Batman and Lethal Weapon. Um, but I think it's also, it was the first Bond film to be rated 15, so you kind of straight away lost a lot of your audience and kind of fan base. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, sadly, I mean, it, it, it's nothing to do with Dalton's acting ability, but I just think, I just think it was the kind of style and the direction that they took the franchise, which I don't think gave him any justice. 
Um, and also, probably, I've noticed that if you talk to, well, not so much Bond fans, but to the general public and casual film fans, they often kind of forget about Dalton because he'd only done two. Mm. Um, a bit like Lazenby. You know, they, they kind of forget about Lazenby because he'd only done one. Um, so, yeah, I, I think for me... They're very, very respected in Bond circles, aren't they? In Bond groups. Oh, yeah, definitely. Lazenby and definitely. Dalton get a lot of airplay. Mm, absolutely. Um, I mean, Lazen, I mean, Dalton especially because, you know, he was, you know, played it true to the character, which I think is brilliant. But unfortunately for the 1980s and for the time he played Bond, I just don't think the audience and some of the fans are kind of ready for that sort of, mm. you know, kind of that, that sort of approach. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that that's why I think Dalton's, number five really is because I just don't think he had such a huge impact on the franchise as say Piers Brosnan did or Daniel Craig. Does, um, um, does anyone else have um, Mr. Dalton in fifth place? If now, hold up or forever hold your silence. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got him. Uh, hey. There he is, yeah, there is. And, yeah. And Matthew, so, yeah, I, I agree with that. Are your views similar to, to Matthew Grice's, or are there other reasons why he's? Uh... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think what Matt Sam is pretty much, you, you know, pretty much good. I mean, he's a very well regarded actor within the community, and I think he's a growing sort of uh, someone that people are, are kind of respecting more than they did before, maybe because of Craig, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, he just seemed a bit theatrical sometimes. You know, and and a bit dull in places. A, a lot of anger and a lot of emotion. He that was his bond, but mm. to me, it was a bit too much. I think, mm. um, and and lost a bit of that charm and that suaveness that you'd kind of expect. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's my reasons. I, I think I, what I find interesting about Dalton is that it's all you both of you, both the Matts have said it tonight, which is that he's very well regarded as an actor. And if you speak to people within the Bond fan community, nine out of 10 times, you'll often hear somebody say, well, the best, technically the best actor to play the role is Timothy Dalton. I think that does slight misservice by some of the other actors who have played Bond. I think they're equally good, but in different ways. But there's no doubt about it. He had a very esteemed, you know, theatrical career. He was already doing pretty well in supporting roles in, in movies by the point, by the time he got Bond. But for me, Dalton, and I really like him, but he's the example of one of those really good actors that doesn't have that little X factor that then makes him a film star. And I think there are other actors that are likely to pop up on this list who are maybe not as good acting wise, but have that X factor, that charisma, that kind of je ne sais quoi that makes them more of a big screen actor. And I find it interesting with Dalton that I think he has succeeded post Bond more as a supporting actor rather than a leading man. And that's not to denigrate his talents whatsoever, but I just think there are certain actors who can carry a movie. And I think he does very, very well as Bond. But I can kind of see why the public on a the, on the whole didn't necessarily uh, latch onto him as much as the fans did. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I, um, he's not actually my fifth, but as we're, as we're talking about Timothy Dalton, he... Um, he managed to kind of worm his way up my chart a bit because I watched uh, The Living Daylights recently. And I really do love that film. I really love The Living Daylights. I know, I know um, a, lot of, um, a lot of people on the, on the group uh, have, a, have a soft spot for License to Kill, but for me, that, is, that to me is not his strongest film and not one of the strongest films in the series, personally. But I think he gets the balance pretty much right in The Living Daylights. And I think his performance in The Living Daylights is pretty fantastic. But he's helped in that by a wonderful score. It's a great looking film. And actually, I think he pitched it right in that. And I think in License to Kill, it went too far. Um, personally, I thought it was too far. If, if There's aspects of License to Kill that are just not very much fun. And, and I, I do believe that most Bond films, you want to be quite a bit of fun. And I just think that License to Kill went a bit too far. But on Living Daylights alone, he's managed to make his way up my chart. And that's one of the great shames that he never got to do the third film. Yeah. Because if you look at the long runners, you could probably argue in, in pretty much most of the cases that they fully fit the role by the time they come to do the third film. And I've always felt that Dalton would have got the balance of, I, I completely agree with you, I much prefer Living Daylight. Um, and I think the third movie would have course corrected more between 
a balance between living daylights and license to kill. And this, that when you read about some of the things that would have happened in that third film, it sounds like great fun. Yeah, you know, and, and actually, it would have been nice to see him play that. But it's one of those. It's one of the few films in the series. One of those many imaginary films that always do very well in these in these uh, situations. Uh, I mean, because right. well, just quickly regarding that third film, and I think Ian had um, pointed it out that even though it was rumoured to be the property of a lady, I think that was generally uh, just a fan fan idea. Um, because interestingly, there was actually um, probably about two or three stories and sort of outlines which were kind of developed for Timothy Dalton's third Bond film. Um, and it's also interesting because traditionally that third Bond film for that actor becomes their kind of uh, sort of going for gold, you know, like Goldfinger, that made Connery, Spy mm -hmm. Lovely, Pudmore on the map, Skyfall made, you know, Daniel Craig. So he kind of thinks, you know, would Dalton have got it bang on right for that third Bond film? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I mean, it, 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 it's definitely, you know, one of them interesting kind of what if moments, really. Yeah, um, he was uh, he was not massively popular in America, was he? And I think that always makes a big difference no. in terms of no. how how well they're retained. Because I think well, the producers also, probably would have kept him, wouldn't they? If, if you're looking at the usual two-year gap, then yeah, I, I think absolutely they would have kept him. I mean, what's interesting about the um, the third film is that I think it was rumoured, wasn't it, that John Landis was going to direct it, um, which I think is just, you know, I mean, I'm a huge, mm. you know, American wealth in London and Blue Bro <laughs> Blues Brothers fans and all that, but I, I can't I can't quite picture a John Landis directed Bond film, although I know he um, he worked on the script for, was it Spy Love Me? When he was quite young. Okay, yeah. Um, so that, that intrigues me. Yeah, I think if they'd have done a two-year gap, if it had been business as usual, I think Dalton would have got his third. Um, and also, just quickly, because I know, I know we've got to move on, but I think what always slightly went against Dalton in the public's eye is that it was meant to be Pierce Brosnan, mm. as far as they were concerned, because of the yeah. big public announcement. Pierce Brosnan was Bond, then suddenly he's not Bond, and then suddenly this guy called Timothy Dalton's Bond. And I think that might have gone against him a little bit. I've got a slight confession there, which is awful, because I was very young at the time. <laughs> I didn't, have a, clue. Young, I didn't have a clue about Pierce Brosnan. Not a clue. You know, as, as my young 13-year-old self, I hadn't got a clue that someone else was meant to have that role. It took me years to realise that, which is terrible, really. An awful confession. Okay, well, so we've got two of, two of our um, fifth places, which means we've got two to reveal, uh, even though we might not uh, talk about our fifth place person at length. Let's have our uh, reveals then of fifth. Oh, look at that. So we've got Roger Moore in one fifth place. We'll talk about Roger later. And, um, and uh, Mr. Lasky can say why Roger Moore rated so lowly on his chart. And I've got, I'm the only person who's got Pierce there in fifth. And I'm saying now, up until probably about 24 hours ago, he was higher. So he's only ended up there, and I really do like Pierce Brosnan, so it's certainly not a, uh, a reflection, but I just had to make my choices. So uh, we're going to move on um, to our fourth places, and fourth place, I'm going to ask uh, Ian Lasky, could you uh, reveal your fourth place, please? <laughs> Brosnan. 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 Why Brosnan in fourth? Um, well, I have to be honest, kind of like what, Gricey said, you know, it's very difficult ranking actors that you enjoy very much in their movies. And I would have to say that if I, I was flip-flopping with Moore and Brosnan for quite some time, they are essentially a joint fourth and fifth, if, if you could do that. Um, but no, I've always liked Brosnan. Um, I feel he kind of gets a bit of a raw deal these days in the, in the fan community. He, a lot of people don't like him as much as um, I, would, I, I would expect people. I, I think he is a good, solid... Yep, he's very middle of the road. He's probably the most generic Bond on screen. You know, he's good looking, he's suave, he's pretty good with a queer, he's pretty good in the action. He's probably the most believable seducer of ladies since <laughs> Connery, um, which is one of the reasons why I mark Roger Moore down. Um, but, you know, I just, I like him. I, I mean, I think he suffers from being in probably the most run-of-the-mill series of films. I really like GoldenEye. Tomorrow Never Dies is, is an okay, fun action movie that's trying to be a bit John Woo at the end. 
Um, I think the world is not well, the world is not enough is my Ros and Bond film that I wish was so much better because I think it's actually one of the most interesting. And I think he acts in that very, very well. There's there's a lot of quiet moments with Brosnan where you, you kind of sense that he's he's acting more introspectively. There's you, you can see things going on in his behind his eyes. I quite like that sort of slightly more reserved style of acting, which will come back in later on in my list. Um, if I have a criticism of him, I think he he overplays the comedy a little bit. You kind of can see that he comes from a sort of American television sort of sitcom like light romantic drama kind of background that he sort of slightly overdoes the kind of quips and now and then and the comic exaggeration gestures and that um but i've always felt that he was an actor that was capable of doing more i mean i don't think he's the deepest actor i don't think he's got the greatest range um but i think he's by no means the least effective actor to play james bond um and it's a pity that he didn't quite get the scripts to deliver on the talent that I think he has. I think they relied too much on him being um, a good looking, handsome, light, romantic action character. Um, very much the antithesis of what Dalton was doing. And I think that very much is a reflection of, of what Matthew was saying about License to Kill not doing very well. He had this long break of so many years, six years, whatever it was. And I think there was a real collective decision to let's get somebody in a kind of roger moore style actor that we know is popular to a degree already that's going to play it fairly safe it's not going to do anything too dramatic or anything too controversial and it's freakingly freakishly good looking so you know it's going to get people swooning over him and it worked mm -hmm. um but it's a shame that the films didn't then develop to sort of you know a little bit more interesting dramatic dramatically as, as the um franchise went on under him. Ian, would you have liked to have seen him do Casino Royale? No. Okay, that's very, very quick and honest. Yeah, no, no, because I don't think, I, I wouldn't have, I would have liked him to have seen, I would have liked to have seen him do something more in the vein of, I'm not saying Skyfall, but more in the vein of something like that, where a slightly older veteran one. Yeah. To me, the charm of Casino Royale is the reboot element of it and, and, and what that actor brings to the role. And I don't think, I mean, to some extent, he kind of had a sort of semi-Casino Royale with The World Is Not Enough. It's a similar scenario where he's yeah. sort of sort yeah. of falling for a woman and she turns out to be the betrayer, the, the, the big villain, which I wish they would do something like that again in the series. We need a big female villain. Um, but no, I would have liked to have seen him do a more sort of seasoned veteran kind of slightly melancholic you know yeah that's what i would like yeah. um with, uh, without um prompting anyone if they've got brosnan higher uh has anyone else got him in in fourth no okay Ooh. um obviously I, i'd already had him and he was in fifth place um but i was trying to think what because like yourself i found it really difficult to pick between fourth and fifth um, and I think the thing that I, I like all of Brosnan's films, um, not as keen on Tomorrow Never Dies, but I like all of Brosnan's films. I think Die Another Day is great fun. Um, mm -hmm. And the thing I think he, and I know Matthew Wood might disagree with this, I think he's got some very solid championship level films, but he never made a Premier League film. And, I, and my view was, and the reason I had him in fifth is because my view is, all the other four above him have, and that's what I meant by The Living Daylights. I would put The Living Daylights somewhere in that top batch of seven or eight films. Um, I, would, I would say GoldenEye's pretty high up there, personally. I mean, I, it's, that definitely seems to be a film that, at the time, I remember being really impressed with it, and I've always really enjoyed it. But it does seem to have fallen away in a lot of people's affections as the years have gone by. Um, I mean, what I, what I will just add one final thing about this is that I think he suffers nowadays from who he followed and who followed him. Mm. When, you're sam when you're sandwiched between Timothy Dalton and Daniel Craig, mm. um, your deficiencies are a little bit more obvious. Mm. Yeah, whereas, um, I mean, I, I, I kind of mentioned it a few weeks ago to you guys that I think with Brosnan, he is, as you rightly said, is it's kind of sort of a hybrid between Connery and Roger Moore. And if Pierce, 
had done the living daylights, I think that would have been a perfect balance to have sort of gone from what Roger Moore had left. And, you know, with Brosnan having that little bit of a cold side as well, would have been perfect to sort of blend into the Daniel Craig era, mm. which is kind of more the reason to think that maybe Timothy Dalton didn't really have such a huge kind of impact on the franchise. Yeah. Um, I think if Pierce Brosnan was Bond, you know, instead of Dalton, um, I think it would have just been, a, you know, been a lot more of a better sort of transition. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would say about Brosnan, and it was my first cinema, I think I mentioned it before, but my first James Bond as an, as, uh, an ad, going as an adult to watch mm. James Bond was Goldeneye. And um, I've never experienced any, any kind of reaction in a cinema the same as Goldeneye. I've never been in a cinema where people are cheering. I've never been in a cinema where people have been so ecstatic that a film series is back. <laughs> and Goldeneye caught people's imaginations. It's, it's without doubt my wife's favourite Bond film by a long way and Brosnan is her favourite mm. Bond by a long way because, apart from anything else, she finds him incredibly attractive. So it's kind of, I think that's part of it. But Goldeneye, mm. for a generation, including the game of Goldeneye, was uh, a game changer. And I think whatever else yeah. happens, Brosnan played a massive part in that. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I've got a lot of time for Goldeneye. Yeah, I think, he, I think he's definitely uh, an underrated Bond. Um, I do think that in, in his day, he was more popular than he was now. I do think since Daniel Craig's mm -hmm. come on, that he kind of would look back on that period of time and thought, well, you know, maybe it wasn't as great. But personally, I think, I mean, I saw Goldeneye. That was the last Bond film I saw of his, strangely enough. I don't know why that was. I don't think they showed it on TV as much. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't actually see any of Brosnan's until I got the video of The World Is Not Enough. Mm. And I absolutely loved it. It's, it's my favourite of his films. So, yes. Yeah, mm. uh, but I, I do think his films are dated more than any other film because the technology from the 90s to now rapidly yeah. changes in decades. Yeah, definitely. It, yes. There's, a weird show. Yeah, there's really parts show. of Goldeneye where they're talking about email and the internet. And it is like, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, I know. I, I get what you're saying. Um, and I mean, also, that's, um, He's going through that kind of stage like Roger Moore did, where the 80s looked very 80s for a while, and the 90s look yes. incredibly 90s now, don't they? And I do think it's as well with Brosnan. He, I don't know why, as um, I think Ian Lasky was saying, that his, his films didn't really push on, but they're, very, they're good. Uh, he's a good all-rounder. I don't know how someone can be accused of being kind of innocuous and create such negativity. You know, if, if, if he was an extreme Bond... I could understand why he would create such extremes, but he seems to generate negativity that I think is thoroughly undeserved. I mean, I remember, I mean, I don't know if you guys remember, but um, I remember after Die Another Day, I mean, people forget Die Another Day was actually very, very successful. Yeah. I think the, each of Pierce Brosnan's films was more successful than the predecessor. I think the only exception being Tomorrow Never Dies, I think that makes slightly less than Goldmore. But each film was generally was progressively more successful. Um, and there was an expectation that he was going to do a fifth. I think he, I seem to recall he said it in interviews that he'd been asked back um, by Barbara Brock and Michael J. Wilson to do, to do a fifth, and he was really looking forward to it. And then, of course, ch plans change, and he, he wasn't rehired, and then went with Daniel Craig. And then there was that weird period where very publicly he was going on talk shows and kind of saying, I want to do another one, but I've not been told. I don't know what's going on. And there was actually quite, I seem to recall, maybe I'm rose-tinted glasses or whatever, I recall that there was quite a, a public backlash against the idea of him not being hired. Yeah. People wanted him to play Bond again for a fear. And, and I think that slightly factored into the negativity that Daniel Craig faced initially when he, took, when he was given the role. Yeah. Um, I remember it being a bit of a sort of, sort of semi-scandal in the media when, when he was sacked. He wasn't sacked because he wasn't hired, but you know what I mean. Um, so I think at the time, I agree with you, I think at the time he was very, very popular and something's changed. Mm. Um, I mean, I know he's, a lot of people tend to take the mickey out of his uh, famous pain face. Um, but I mean, I, don't, I mean, did Mama Mia, did that do him any favours? Uh, whether it did him any favours or not, I mean, I think, you know, again, he's he's... He is a kind of, I think, a light kind of, I call him like a matinee idol actor. He's yeah. a kind of light, romantic, comedic actor, mm. you know. Um, 
I, for me, one of my favourite films of his is the Thomas Crown Effect. Mm. Um, yes. uh, yeah. And I think he's perfectly cast in that. I, and I, I know this is heresy, Alex. Don't but say, I actually, do not say it. Okay, I won't <laughs> say it. You've read my mind. I, I, I um, know what you're going to say. You know what I'm going to say. Um, no, um, so you, your, your view is that um, uh, he out McQueen's McQueen? I think he was slightly more believable in the role. The mm. problem I have with McQueen in that film, and this is a tangent, is that I don't believe he's a high-flying businessman. Yeah, it's one of my least favourite McQueen performances, yeah. actually. I, I think I'll probably agree with you on that. Um, have we, so who else have we got in mm. four places? Would you like to uh, hold them up? Ooh. I I <laughs> Sorry, Alex. <laughs> it's, they, it's really, really difficult. That's really difficult. Really that's, uh, well, you've got two controversial choices there. Um, and I guess we will get into um, more in-depth uh, views on those actors. And you can uh, chip in when we get to them. Um, and we have next... Matthew Wood, would you like to let us know who you have in number three? Please? Yeah, so make sure I can get mixed up. So 003 is. Oh. Can you see that? Oh, uh, yes, oh. can. Yeah, Roger, Roger Moore. Moore. Okay, your views on Roger Moore, Matthew? Um, well, it's hard to sum it up. I've been trying to think about this all day, actually, but he, he is just an. He is Bond, really. I, that's how I see it. When you see Roger Moore, you think to yourself, if you can have a list of anybody, any actor that could play Bond, he would be on every list, I can imagine. Even if you didn't like him, he would, he would you know, be, be up there to be Bond. I like Roger because he's, he's got that English gentleman look to him. He's got the sound of, of a Bond. He's very professional. Um, the only thing that lets him down is his physicality. That's as far as I can see. He wasn't a very physical Bond. But the way they worked around this was brilliant because he always outwitted his opponents. Um, he outwitted the billions. And, and the best example I can think of is in Moonraker when the assassin's up the tree and he's doing the clay pigeon shooting. And he said, oh, you missed, did I? And then he falls down. And uh, such good sport, you know. And it's just unbelievable. He was great with the ladies, you know. Um, he had the humour. He was suave, you know. He was... And, and his films took you places where you wanted to go. Yes. You know, yes. There, there was no dull locations. So, um, yeah, he's, he's definitely a firm, one of my favourite, yeah. Um, Ian Lasky, you had him in fifth. What, what yeah. is, what is, what's the problem with Rod? Like I said, it, it's kind of, fourth and fifth to me were, were a coin flip. But the reason why I, I relegated Rod to fifth, so Rod, um, you know, first of all, I, I think as an actor and as a human being, I think he was top. He was a top-notch human being. I think mm -hmm. the work he did for uh, UNICEF wasn't it? I think it was probably more important than anything he's ever done with Bond. Um, which is not to say that, again, to demean his Bond work, but I think the UNICEF work was that good and that important. And I think he should be forever um, thanked for that. Um, and I was very lucky. I happened to be at a film screening many years ago at London. I was sat in the front row, didn't know anything about it, and Roger Moore stood, walked out into, into the audience, stood right in front of me, and gave a five-minute introduction to the director. And he was urbane, charming, witting, w charming, witty, humble. He was, he was a really lovely guy. So I think as a person, you know, top-notch, I just find there are two of his films that I actually dislike. Um, and that has dropped him down quite a bit for me. I don't particularly like his last two films. Um, and I don't find him particularly charming when it comes to the ladies. I actually find him, a, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I find him a bit lechy. Creepy. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's, it's that kind of, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think he's actually, he, of all the actors, he incorporates a lot of the kind of sort of, high living snobbery of Fleming's character. And, and you know, I, he, he is the Bond that I think would be fussy about what he eats, where he eats it, what mm. he was wearing at the time yes. and all that. And, I, and I, I could actually imagine him acting in a kind of 1950s period version of Bond. I think mm. he would fit it to a T. Mm. Um, I just don't find him a ladies man. 
Um, <laughs> and the problem for me with, with his Bond is that so much of his movies were about him seducing ladies. I mean, I think he has, what, two, three bed scenes per film, at least? I mean, that um, scene in The Man with the Golden Gun, when he was like, you know, had a go on Maud Adams whilst Griff Teckland was in the wardrobe. In the war, yeah. I mean, um, who the bloody hell does that? And can you get away with that? Well, you know. But, I, I mean, mean the, fact that, the fact that his name is innuendo itself is, oh, is yeah, kind of, you know. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I kind of agree with, I think Alex, you were saying about Brosnan have, not having an absolute A-list in the film. And I do see that Roger does. Yeah. Um, but I also think he has some Z-lists as the films as well. He's, uh, what's interesting is that he's kind of got this, um, a reputation for... Um, just being Roger Moore, and who's happening to be playing James Bond. Well, I think he's yeah. quite different in his different films. He's very different in uh, First two. Man with a Golden Gun to Moonraker. For Your Eyes Only, yes. different again. A View to a Kill is quite different again. And it's, I, I quite like the fact he plays it in slightly different ways. I do get the feeling it's kind of, because he's just reacting to the film before or what he's been told, which, which is fine. Um, and I do think it's a shame that, because he looked so good in Live and Let Die. He looked really good, and I think he just, uh, I think we mentioned it last, last time, where he seemed to go from looking five years younger than he was to five years older uh, by the time he finished, and I think that was a, sh uh, that was a shame. And I've, I agree with Ian Lasky, um, even though I quite like A View to a Kill, that he probably did stay on for a couple of films too long. Mm. Yeah, um, and I, I think I agree with you also about the mm. fact that I think he does play it slightly different. And, and I have to say, even though it's a film that most people dislike a lot, I think, for me, his most convincing performance as Bond is in The Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah. Because he's um, just that bit tougher. It's interesting, because, yeah, I mean, when you see his performance in that film, it is different to Live and Let Die. Mm. Um, but I think in the hotel scene, uh, when he was about to uh, break uh, Maud Adams' arms, Oh, um, I think Roger Moore himself was quite uncomfortable with yeah. doing that and obviously I mean they wanted that sort of Sean Connery kind of edge to him and um, I mean yeah I mean the man with the golden gun there is some really good moments in there especially dark moments yeah. um, and but for me I think The Spy of Me and Moonraker are probably the most cheesiest of films in the sense of just what he says to the women and kind of how he gets them. So, well, there's no way that would work in real life. Um, but then, for your eyes only, that's my favourite Bond film of his. I think, mm. you know, real dark, dark classic thriller. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, with Roger Moore, I mean, obviously with his seven films, because he is my third, third choice as well. Um, and I think, yeah, I suppose with those seven films, each film does slightly differ. He does kind of play a little bit of a, a different role on it, which, you know, I think's, you know, sort of interesting. See, I've got, I, 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 he, he's also my number three. Yeah. Um, and I, the film, I, I have to say, I think as, as I get older, um, my tastes in, in the Bond films has changed dramatically. And I used to kind of think, oh, you know, I want, I want to watch the films that are, you know, uh, closer to Fleming and more serious. But if someone said to me now, you will never get to watch one of those films again, or you'll never get to watch Moonraker again, I would really miss not watching Moonraker. I'd really miss not sitting down over Christmas and watching The Spy You Loved Me or, uh, or um, For Your Eyes Only. I think, they're, I think they're really kind of comforting Bond films. And maybe it's just because, um, you know, when I was little, he was, he was James Bond for such a long time. And it was either a Roger film or a Sean film that was on TV. And the Roger film, you know, with you know, Jaws and the kind of, I, 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 I really find his films very likeable. They're just not quite as um, convincing, I don't think, as, as some of the- I, I think it's the um, Sunday afternoon bond, you know, yeah. you, you could put oh, yeah. his films on and just for entertainment, you'll be entertained for two hours. Yeah. You, obviously the critic side of it, there's different people that say different things, but firstly, I just think it's just a thoroughly entertaining bond. You could just put a film on any time with him. Yeah, and and don't get me wrong, I, I really do enjoy him. As, as, you know, my my nitpicking is nitpicking, um, and I've, I've I've learned to shut my eyes and do that when he starts kissing the ladies. Um, I mean, I certainly need a um, 
kind of take lessons uh, from him whilst he kisses a lady because I I want to know why does he suck his cheeks in whilst kissing him. And I mean, I kind of jokingly try that to me other half and she just like hates it. She kind of like literally kind of throws me, you know, throws me across the room. And he's like, well, if it worked for Roger Moore, why yeah. is it not working for me? What am I not doing right? You know. Throws you across the room. Wow. Well, you know, it kind of like pushes me away, you know. <laughs> I, w- I will say this. I not literally just... like a May Day kind of. <laughs> yes, over the spins you around. <laughs> yeah. I think what I would say is, what I was saying about um, my wife finding um, Pierce Brosnan very, very attractive, at the other end of the spectrum of attractivity, of attractiveness, attractivity, is uh, Roger. Because she finds his, um, his neck, I think, is the, one of the main. <laughs> um, and she just, especially by the end, when he's kind of got that weird dome hair thing going on, he yeah. looked quite strange by then. I mean, if you saw him looking like that out and about, it's, it's quite an extreme look, isn't it? And I think she, she struggles with that. And I don't think she's necessarily in a minority there. I think, I think, I think actually, if I think about it honestly, I think my criticism in that department is less on Roger Moore and more on the way the films are written when it comes to that. There, there is a kind of cheesy 70s British sexy sitcom kind of corniness to, to some of the that aspect of the film yeah and and that you know i know a lot of people who are watching this are probably screaming oh he's too politically correct but that that does date politically correct (laughs) um, that that does date that aspect of the films more than i think it does in the connery era where i think he's Mm. genuinely a bit more charming and the women in those movies have more agency um one thing i will add just finally about roger i wish he had taken himself more seriously as an actor because I think he actually has, he had more skill as an actor than, than he allowed himself. Um, he was far too self-deprecating about his skills. The whole business about, you know, I have, I've, I act with this eyebrow, I act with this eyebrow. Um, he, he does have, he did have more depth to his range as an actor. And I just wish every now and then he would take the role a little bit more seriously so we could see that a bit more. You do, you do get kind of glimpse behind that curtain in For Your Eyes Only, don't you? You there are parts of that where you think actually he's mm. this is quite a Fleming-esque performance here and he's pulling it off really yeah. well. And then that yeah. kind of you went back to Octopussy and it was kind of back to comedy Roger. Uh, which was a shame actually, I thought. Um I mean with Roger Moore as, as well, I, I mean I'm not too sure if you guys have seen it, but one of the um, early films he did was The Man Who Haunted Himself. Yeah, it's brilliant. And that brilliant. is an absolute fantastic film. And the thing, what makes us so great is Roger Moore is completely different because Roger Moore has always said that he kind of literally plays himself and he's like an extension of his own character. Whereas if you see him in The Saint, he is pretty much kind of like Bond. Yeah. But with the man who wanted himself, he is, he does actually act differently and it is such a fantastic performance. And as, you know, and as uh, Ian quite rightly said, if he had done more kind of, things you know films like that um but then if you looked i, I think he did um boat trip in 2003 uh well that's just sort of i mean that's something else to watch just for the comedy value but he's that's good. kind of he's very one from it to the other world as well hmm. spite yes yeah spite. they played the kind of blow like villain um, um okay uh so i've got uh more in third matthew wood's got more in third so we, could we see um, Ian and Matthew Grice, what have you got in, who have you got in third or who's in third? I've got Roger Moore. And Dalton. Okay, so we've discussed both of those, uh, which is great. Okay, so we're into second place and I think it's me to say who I've got in uh, second place, if I can find it. Um, Second and third, again, I was a bit torn between uh, this person and, and Roger for second place, uh, but my second place goes uh, to Danny Boy. Um, and my reasoning behind it, I really like Daniel Craig as an actor even before he was bonded. I think that, uh, that probably helps. Um, I know we've mentioned Steve McQueen once before in this conversation, but there's definitely an aspect of that kind of um, 
But, and, and actually, strangely, both highly trained actors, but they don't come across as highly trained actors. And picking up on something that Ian Lasky said earlier, I genuinely believe that um, Daniel Craig's got movie star quality and, and a lot of it. Um, it took a bit of getting used to because he's very rugged in that first film. He's very kind of physical in that first film. But I think he's developed the character really well. I love Skyfall, absolutely love Skyfall and love him in Skyfall. And I think that um, even in the films that he's made, that I well, so Spectre, for instance, especially the second half of Spectre, I'm really not that keen on at all. But I still think his performance in it is very, very good. I think picking up on the bits we've talked about that maybe some of the other actors are, are maybe not their strongest points. I think he's believable in the um, action scenes. I think he's highly believable in the love scenes. Um, I think he has got a good range when it comes to showing emotion. Um, some people, I saw something the other day, but people think he tries a bit hard. I'm not, not sure about that, to be honest. I think he, he comes across as quite a natural actor, especially, I mean, like the moment in Casino Royale and in the shower, I know people mention it, that to me brought a real depth to the Bond character. Um, I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely hope that No Time to Die is right up there with Skyfall and he finishes his tenure as he, sh as he deserves to on a high because I think he's brought an awful lot to the party, a lot to the series, and I've got a lot of respect for his, his take on Bond. So um, that's my thoughts on Daniel Craig. I, I, happy for anyone to add to that. Yeah, um, well, I think I um, might know who your number one might be, Alex. Hmm. Well, yeah, of course. Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, this Daniel, Daniel Craig, Craig. Yeah, totally agree. Great great fifth film. Daniel Craig makes a great fifth film. He's in the reckoning. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, Daniel Craig. Yeah, I I think he's absolutely fantastic. Um, I just kind of always feel that there should have been another film between Quantum and Skyfall. Uh, because just the Skyfall, I mean, yeah, it's a brilliant film, but it the the sort of like the look of Bond and the direction, the styles was completely different to Quantum of Solace. Um but yeah, I mean with Daniel Craig, I I, I yeah, I, I I think it's fantastic. Well I think you're right in that he went from kind of if, if Quantum follows directly on from Casino, he's gone from just qualified to over the hill, isn't he? Over the hill, yeah. Uh, see, I don't, I, don't, um, I don't interpret Skyfall like that. I, I, I interpret Skyfall as not so much that he's over the hill as he's physically too old or anything like that. I think it's a midlife crisis Bond film, which I guess is age-related. But also it's, it's a, a Bond film that feels betrayed and suddenly feels unsure of himself and um, feels um, like he was let down and it's all of that aspect it's it's, it's angst bond um which i absolutely adore i mean i absolutely yeah. adore that film um i may wax lyrical about daniel craig a little bit later yeah and um, he would you skyfall fourth hmm? right? yeah i'd even fourth yeah um and and this is uh, like like ian said earlier it's hard to rank everybody because they're all really really good I don't think there's one Bond that I think, actually, I just don't really don't like them. And that, that's true. Well, I don't know, maybe maybe Nelson, I don't know. I really don't like that. Um, yeah, so with Daniel Craig, you know what? I think the action scenes he's brought to the table and the physicality has gone through the roof. You know, what he's brought compared to the other Bonds in, in that respect is massive. Um, the only thing I, I do find that the emotional side of it, the angst is played upon a bit too much. I do think it's a bit overkill at times and he has that charisma sort of is lost a little bit on, in certain places. I do think he, he got back in Spectre a little bit where he was a bit more sort of doing a few, he was a bit more comfortable with the one-liners. I remember Skyfall, he did the um, the deep water one-liner and it would just come across as really cheesy for me um, at the end and he's sort of sniggering and I was thinking he just, he just seemed to be uncomfortable with it for some reason. But um, Skyfall is my favourite Craig film. I do think it's fantastic. Um, Casino, I was okay with. It took me a while to get used to it. I think it's better, better now for me. And Spectre sort of mid table. Um, but no, I, I think it should be respected because he, well, he's been a lot to the franchise and the series as a whole. But for me, I just prefer three other fellas. I, okay, I will wax lyrical right now for a <laughs> second. Um, it's going to become obvious where I'm going to rank Daniel Craig anyway. But um, 
for me, what he's done that none of the other actors have really done is he's made Bond more of a character. Mm. And more importantly than that, his James Bond is different from film to film because his yeah. character grows. And his character even grows within the course of each film. So if you think about where he is as a character at the beginning of, obviously at the beginning of Casino Royale, to where he is at the end of Spectre, it's very different. Mm. Um, if you see, but then if you take where he is at the end of, at the beginning of Quantum and at the end of Quantum is different. Same with Skyfall, so, you know, all of the films, that all the other actors bring little elements to their character as a Bond. But at the end of the day, the characters are quite static because that's how we like our action heroes. We kind of like them reliable and predictable. We go to them because we know what we're going to get. We're going to get the unflappable hero, yeah. which is great for decades. But I kind of was ready to see something more done with the character of Bond because I felt it could be done. And, um, and I never expected it to be a reboot. Who, who knew that was going to be on the cards? And I think what they've done, what they've allowed Daniel Craig to bring to the role and what they provided him in terms of writing is really, really interesting. And it's the most creatively interesting period of films for me in terms of characters. Mm. Um, which is not to say that all of the movies work brilliantly. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of Spectre. But look what they're doing with the, f the fifth movie. We don't even know what No Time to Die is. But we're having um, you know, a previous Bond love interest coming back to become a major part of a movie for the second film. You know, he's retired. Clearly the trailer's showing that there's something, you know, there's some kind of trauma going on there. And I think that's really interesting that they're pushing it even further, or so it mm. seems, with the fifth movie. Mm. Um, and you didn't really see that growth with any of the other actors. I can totally understand why some fans don't like that, that they'd rather go back to the kind of traditional sort of hero. But for, for me, I mean, it's just brilliant. Mm. Mm. And I think Daniel Craig's a perfect fake bond for this time as well um i yes. mean I, I think it's probably a very controversial uh, sort of subject but i can remember reading somewhere that daniel craig is probably the only actor to play bond that <laughs> actually acts um in terms of uh, you are there alex that was yeah quite disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah he, he, I, I, I think he's probably the only uh, sort of actor uh, who can actually act because you kind of see the psychological side of Bond as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, Skyfall, I absolutely love. And even though it's an original story, I don't know what it is, but it just seems to scream Fleming to me. It, the, the old thing just seems pure Fleming. And yeah. I absolutely love it. And also with Daniel Craig era, what fans and people need to remember is that this is a separate timeline. So obviously the Casino Royale was seeing in his double O status and throughout those periods of the five films, you know, we gradually see him retire. And, you know, fans may be up in arms about that, but I think, well, what's the problem with that? Because that is life. You know, we are sort of following five episodes of James Bond's life, which we've never really seen before. So, yeah, for me, uh, in this, um... Daniel Craig, fantastic. In this alternative um, film arc, um, why does he drive an Aston Martin and have an ejector seat and have those kind of nods? Would you have preferred it if they just completely moved away from the older films or do you enjoy those little nods to the past? I thought it was really smart how, uh, one of the things I really liked about um, Casino Royale is that it knew that we were expecting those things. And, and you, you have to do it in a sense because it's a franchise that's so long and so storied and so historic. But what I liked about it was that it was um, very cheeky in the way that it, it kind of revealed all the tropes. I like the fact that he wins the Aston from some guy playing, you know, gambling. I like the fine, the fact that, um, you know, he doesn't look like he gives a damn if he's shaken stirred and all this. So that I like the twist. Um, there was very little of it in Quantum. I don't think, if I remember right, I don't think he, he even says my name's Bond, James Bond in Quantum of Solace. Um, yeah, I, the, the, the tricked out DB5 in, in Skyfall, you know, I hate to say something negative about that movie, but maybe that was a tiny bit too far. Mm. Yet everybody in the cinema was probably gutted when it got demolished yeah. during that big shootout. So actually it shows you you know, yeah, there's a huge fondness for that. It's just a piece of iconography. It's no, it's no criticism at all of him as an actor, because I think he's fantastic. But 
do you do you think um, this tendency for him to not follow orders and to kind of be rogue most of the time should is getting a bit repetitive? I don't know. I yeah. think so. Yeah, I think it's becoming a bit boring. <laughs> um, possibly. I mean, it, it, I I don't really notice it if I'm honest. Mm. Um, yeah, I do yeah. think it goes over uh, a bit too much. If you think about it, would you really have someone in the role uh, as a spy or as a person? You know, would you have someone that just wants to leave every now and then, resign, like pretty I much think everything? Been stacked, wouldn't you really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, to be fair, like like you say, the thing about Spy for what I like personally is is a mixture of old and new Bond, and it's perfectly sort of formed together. You've got the references to the older films that the older fans would get, and you've got the sort of the newer themes that the newer generation would appreciate. So for me, that one just it marries the two together really well. But yeah. this new film, I, I know a little bit about it, and this is going to be his best one, hundred percent. I'm pretty sure it will be. I'm very excited about the director of the new one. Yeah, I've, um, I think I've I've really been impressed by this director since I saw the first season of True Detective, and if if he's because he's co-writing it, which I think is the first time any director has co-written a Bond film. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful. But we're going off topic. We're talking about <laughs> Bond actors, no? So, okay. I'll rein it back. Who else have we got in second place? Would you like to hold up the second places? Brosnan. Oh. A lot of love for Brosnan in the room. And my, my wife just celebrated. I just heard a cheer. <laughs> Brosnan, two second places. Some people appear to have made a terrible mistake. Sean Connery's lower on your list, so I don't understand. Not compute. Um, Pierce, for me, was my Bond. He was the Bond that I grew up with. And, you know, when I was at school, when I was a teenager, I used to kind of sort of base my style and sort of, mannerisms on him which probably explains to why i never got a girlfriend um but yeah otherwise you know i i, I he was just bond and he was just a dude and i'm sure matthew would probably kind of sort of uh kind of agree on that to to a degree would you yeah oh 100 i think you know i mean in the 90s when i was growing up um i actually heard of goldeneye the game before the film i didn't know what the film was yes um, yeah and it was the gaming side that I was introduced before I even saw a Brosnan film. I watched yeah. Connery and Moore before Brosnan, and I still rate Brosnan very highly, purely because I think he brings that kind of suaveness. He brings the sort of, the, he's great with the ladies. He's very mm -hmm. seductive. If, you know, if you're trying to, in, in that field, any woman would just go straight to him, guaranteed, just click his yeah. fingers. And, um, but not only that, he does the one-liners really well. He, he hasn't got a great physical side, but he does show it. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's not the weakest of the, of the uh, Bonds. But um, I do think he has got, you know, he, his films maybe he was let down in. I do think the writing could have been better. Um, but his, his performance, I thought, was really good. Mm. Um, I mean, for me, because, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm the same with you, Matthew. Uh, I was introduced to Golden Eye 64 before I saw any of the films. And To My Never Dies was the first Bond film I saw at the cinema. And it was the first sort of action film I saw as well. So just like for an 11 year old boy to experience that pre-title sequence was absolutely exhilarating. So that will always, you know, play a huge part in my life. As well as Piers Brosnan really. Um, at the time, I thought he was a dude. Um, as I've got older, I kind of thought, you know what, he is a little bit cheesy in places. Um, but he has done good films after Bond um, and sort of slightly going off subject, but I do think if Brosnan had done Skyfall, I think that would have been the perfect film for him. You know, if yeah, Brosnan yeah. had carried on as Bond until Skyfall, I'd, I'd, that would have dealt with the old sort of age theme and it would have just been a perfect ending to her, well, to Brosnan's and Judy Dench's relationship as M. So as much as I love Skyfall and as much as I love Craig in it, I also think that would have been a perfect film for Pierce Brosnan as well. Um, but yeah, Pierce, yeah, number two for me, is a complete, utter dude, legend. And uh, Ian Lasky, you've got Sean Connery in uh, second place. But yeah. I haven't talked about Sean yet, so that will probably be the last conversation uh, yeah. when we reveal our number ones. 
Okay, get ready for four George Lazenby's. <laughs> Barry Nelson's. Dun, 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 dun. Nice. Wow, two Craig, two Connery. 50-50 split. Two Craig's and two Connery's. Hang the on. double C's. Connery, Connery, uh, Craig, Craig. Okay. Um, so, um, Matthew Wood, Sean Connery at number one. Oh, yeah, 100%. He's just pure bonds. Everything about him, he's, he, you know, he's got the whole package, I think. He can fight. He's got the, uh, the ladies. He's got the... Rapport with, with the other, uh, with them and that. And to me, you watch Sean Connery, it's so iconic. You know, the way he's introduced, the name's Bond, James Bond. You know, it just comes across so well. And to me, there's just no contest. There's just no contest. He, I just think he's the perfect package. He's got absolutely all the attributes you would need to be a Bond. Hmm. I mean, I'd, um, I agree with you. Obviously, people will know that that's probably what I'd have gone for anyway. So I don't think it's going to be much of an uh, exclusive. Um, and I think it's helped by the fact, so I was trying to kind of think around it. I do think part of it, and I know we should be just concentrating on James Bond, is I, I really do like him in lots of other roles. I really do like him as an actor and um, uh, man who would be king. I love him in The Untouchables. I love him in The Hill. I love him in The Offence. I think he's got incredible um, screen presence, star quality. Um, I kind of relate to him, I guess, a bit because, um, you know, he, he's similar kind of um, a background to my dad so that's kind of part of it um, but most of all I like all his films that's kind of I like all his James Bond films and I know some people will disagree and they'll possibly find um, the later ones uh, not not as easy but they are amongst my favorites so I think part of it is um, even Dalton I don't I only like one of the two Roger Moore definitely there are some of his films that I'm not as keen on um, Daniel Craig uh, Spectre I'm probably not as keen on um, and Sean Connery's I pretty much liked a lot and I think he was James Bond at the time when it looked the most iconic and that 60s look with him in the 60s it takes some beating and it took when we talked about it the other day with those first five films yeah it's, it's pretty difficult to beat so um, yeah I, I, I absolutely love him as James Bond. It's great. And he's, he's, he's the blueprint, you know. Um, and I, I also do feel to some extent that he's kind of taken for granted by the fans, you know. Well, yeah, of course Connor is great. Um, but I think he is integral to the success of that first film. Um, you could have probably, you know, when you hear about all the other actors that were being considered for Dr. No, even the more famous actors at the time, um, I still don't know that the movies would necessarily have worked anywhere near as well as it did with Connery. Um, and I, I think it gets overlooked a lot by fans that how important he was to the success of the franchise. Um, you know, without Connery, we may not have had a James Bond movie number two. Um, no, I think he's terrific. Um, I don't love all of his films. I, I struggle with um, Thunderball, um, but that's the only one. Um, no, I think he's, he's brilliant. Of, of all of the classic, pre-reboot bonds, he's clearly heads and shoulders the best. So, I mean, we've, we've kind of, um, in talking uh, about Daniel Craig and Sean Connery within that sort of second and first place, and clearly there's a quite even split there. Um, in those uh, top fives, no, I, I was ex probably expecting at least one of us to include uh, George. Um, Matthew Grice, why no Lazenby? Um... It's it's just a tough tough one really. Um, I mean again, I mean Lazenby, he was I like him. I mean I like all the bonds. Um, I, I I I don't know. I mean it, it it could be because he probably only did one. And say if he did three or four, he might have generally become a bit more recognised. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I mean when I was younger. Um, I can remember my dad sort of introduced me to the Bond films and he'd always said, oh yeah, on a Majesty's Secret Service, that's rubbish. Uh, the guy who played Bond, crap in it. And for a long time, that kind of stuck with me. And Her Majesty's kind of always sort of confused me, really due to the lack of continuity. Because I thought, well, in you only lived twice, Bond and Blofeld was face to face. Now Blofeld doesn't recognise Bond. And it kind of completely threw me out. 
But then probably about 10, 15 years ago, I read the novel and realised how faithful the film was to the novel. And I completely sort of fell in love with the film. I thought, well, actually, the, you know, this film is pretty good. And lasered me, I mean, he did a pretty good job to say he had no acting experience beforehand. I think he did a real bang up to date job, but I just think maybe if he did two or three films, it might have just gave him a bit more of a, a chance to be recognised more, you know, not just by Bond fans, but probably by the general public, really. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it was a really tough call. Um, I mean, it, 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 I thought, well, if I don't go for Dalton, I might get slated for not going for Dalton, or obviously if I don't go for Lazenby, I'll probably get slated for not going to Lazenby. So it's a real, real tough decision. But, um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it, it, it's just hard to mm. kind of really judge it, really. But, yeah, I, I, I think for me, Lazenby, um, I think it was just the fact that he only did one film and... Obviously, that's not Lazenby's fault as such, but oh. if he had, you know, had the chance to do more, then he might have made it onto the list. <laughs> Ian Lasky? I'm not fond of Lazenby. Um, all I really want from a leading man is, is somebody that, that, that gives a consistent, consistent performance. And there are just a, just a few too many moments with Lazenby where his inexperience as an actor is too obvious. And um, he's, he's the only actor in the role that draws me out of the film because I'm aware that I'm watching somebody who can't act the scene. And I can't act, you know, I, I get it's incredibly difficult and it, you know, it's a real skill and it's often a real natural skill. Um, and I do accept that he, he perform some scenes, some scenes very well, um, but there's not enough consistency. And particularly in that first half of the film, there were just too many scenes where, you know, to use a cliche, he's just too wooden. Um, and he makes these weird vocal inflections, you know, these kind of, mmm, mmm, and, and that just... Could that be the to... dubbing department though? Yeah, but it's still him giving the vocal performance, isn't okay. it? Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> It, it's, it's been like Roger Moore doing the ooh. Oh. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, but, but with Roger, I think there's 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 more charm. Um, you know, you know, Roger's a good example. You know, he's somebody that that did you know it didn't have a lot a lot of gravitas when he was performing the role, but it was completely consistent. Brosnan, completely consistent performance. You know, um, but Lazenby, yeah, no, his inexperience is just too obvious. Too, too often for me, and it does draw me out the film. Matthew? Um, yeah, well, I actually quite like Lazenby. I think he's, he's done all right, um, considering he had no experience apart from the chocolate advert and, and uh, <laughs> myself and whatnot. I mean, to get the role of Bonds, just, can you just imagine that now, just walking into, you know, the Eon office and just saying, I'm James Bond. Who could get away with that? So he must have must have been a good actor to a certain extent, but I mean, he has to me. He's got two great moments in the film. I think the bit where he's escaping um, the guards and he's got the bear and they, they flash the picture. Yeah. I think the horror on his face is really captured, and he does the um, the coat up like that, and he looks very vulnerable. Um, and at the end of the film, as well, I think he's pretty good with Tracy. You know, she's just got killed, and he does very well. But like the others have said, throughout the film, there's bits and pieces where other sort of cast members have to pick him up a bit and you know um but yeah no he is a tough one for me but i think if he'd have done more films yeah then maybe he would have been in consideration yeah and I, I think for i think for me it's not i don't actually i don't necessarily mind him in the film it's just not one of my favorite films and if you've only done one film and it's not one of your favorites you're kind of on a hiding to nothing really mm -hmm. um so that's kind of more where i am with it but i don't i don't um I don't dislike him in it at all, and there are bits that um, you know I think he, he does pretty well in. But there are other parts where um, you know, like Ian Lasky says, he just looks like a, a good guy, a bit out of his depth, you know, which is which is quite difficult, really. But um, okay, so we have got our um, top fives. Um, is there anyone who would change their fives because their favourite they don't actually think is the best, or are you pretty much sure that your favourite is also your top five best? 
Um, I kind of feel guilty because maybe I should have included Lazenby there. <laughs> Who would you drop? Um, don't, don't feel guilty, mate. We, if, we can call it a top six if you like. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's really tough. That, that, that's all I'm going to say. It's just really tough to pick the mm. top five ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, but- I think, I think you did. I think you explained yourself in, in a in a very clear way, Matthew. I think it's yeah. Don't worry. Don't lose sleep over it. Draw no, no. Lazenby's not going to be lurking outside your outside your window. Um, well, uh, hopefully not. Starting a recount. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's been uh, really enjoyable, and I'm tougher than I expected actually in terms of trying to um, just pick a five from such well-known actors. Um, but thank you, uh, Ian Lasky. Thank you, Matthew Wood. You've been a superb special guest. Yeah, that's been great. And thank you, Matthew Grice. Who, you look like you've now sunk into a depression about George Lazenby. Don't, um, don't, worry, don't worry, mate. Oh, you can't change your mind. Oh, I've got me much <laughs> anymore, so that'll uh, show a bit of support. Uh, next time, we're going on to our next batch of five, which um, is from... <clears throat> Moonraker through to a view to a kill. And Oof. you know what that means. Ah, the other, other film from 1983. Okay, Oof. join yeah. us next time when we bond over bond. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>